alongside the show that I've curated here, which is actually still ongoing, but I was asked also to uh, actually uh, dream up a, a film programmation. And since the Prada Foundation is pretty, I mean, adamant about film, I mean, some films premiere there, they have also this beautiful cinema in which you can very comfortably look at the films they program. And so most of the films that I've programmed are actually films that are not necessarily completely linked. Some of them are to the project of the show. But others are also uh, picked out because of their element that deals with, this, with the, the point that you have to see them on a large screen, for example. Immediately there was also the consensus that this programmation would be re-shown, but then in the Cinematheque in Brussels. Uh, so it became a sort of collaboration where I will also talk about the films and I also program certain films because I think it's important for a younger generation to look at these films and to sort of rediscover the fact that there is not just mainstream cinema but there is a really important sort of cultural backlash when we talk about film. But the very first film that I made a point of to show here, and that uh, will be the first one be sh that will be shown in this programmation, is a film I saw when I was 20 years old and had a real impact on the way I thought about culture and art in general. And also the idea of violence in different forms and formulations, in a sense. And that film is a very lengthy film, which will be shown in two sessions, or maybe more, I don't know, because it's seven hours. And it's a film of, it's the end of a triptych of uh, the filmmaker Hans-Jürgen Sieberberg, who in the end of the 60s and the 70s years, in the 70s, actually made first film Ludwig II, or Ludwig II, the king of Bayern, of course, the, who never married, and became the first pop idol, nearly, in terms of what we perceive as a king. And Karl May, who was the writer and author of uh, Old Shatterhand and Winnetou, but which was also actually the preferred author, childhood author of uh, Adolf Hitler. And the film that I picked was the last one of the triptych, which sort of sums up 150 years of German history, in a sense, but also culture. And that film is called Hitler, ein Film aus Deutschland. So the second film that I actually programmed with is the film of Greed, the film by Erich von Stroheim, which was actually destroyed by the people who actually produced it, the production house who produced the film in Hollywood. I think it's a very important film and an important filmmaker. I mean, if one could compare, for example, the importance of Stroheim or Eisenstein, in a sense, much lesser known in a way, a film that was, at the time that it was produced, actually quite... Uh, quite an offensive film, and therefore was also, by the producers, turned into something more manageable. And I think we can see the leftovers of the film. I think it's an interesting point to see <coughs> how actually also film is mutilated, in a sense. And it's, of course, a way to revive the attention to it. Another film, or a set of films that I wanted to show for the longest time, are short films made by an artist, uh, Peter Weiss, who were made in Sweden in the 60s, I think. They're different pieces of film, which I found extremely interesting because they deal with the medium of film as an intelligible and also a sort of physical intelligence in film that you can see. And it's made by an artist, so I think that also makes it quite specific in a sense. Then there is also uh, the film Le Mépris by Godard, <coughs> which in itself is a film that Godard now hates, probably, but I think is a film that will never be made again. Since there will never be the same possibility, it's an epical movie in a sense also. It's also in an iconic, the, the film plays out in an iconic piece of architecture, which is by Malaparte, which, by the way, is an Italian writer, the writer of La Pelle Caput, who had this villa constructed in Capri on a rock, nearly inaccessible, a modernist villa, where then you can see Brigitte Bardot, and that's why the film will never be made again, uh, alongside people like Fritz Lang, who is dead, 
uh, Brigitte Bardot is still alive, but you will never see Brigitte Bardot again uttering the same dialogue without understanding zilch about it. So it's an interesting film, which in a very weird way is epic and cynical at the same time. That's then also a film that I wanted to show is a film by David Lynch, who actually now paints again and started as a painter. And, but also deals with this, this specific idea of violence and this specific intelligence, this sort of like physical intelligence in film. And that was actually, that's the film Blue Velvet. Up until the point that I saw Blue Velvet, and I saw it in a very small, much smaller than this, so, sort of corner theater in my hometown in Antwerp with five people, I think, I was completely shocked because I had first seen, also by accident, Eraserhead and The Elephant Man and June, but I didn't realize until Blue Velvet that David Lynch was actually an American filmmaker. So that was kind of an extreme twist. There is, of course, Werner Herzog, Zorn des Gottes, Agir, Zorn des Gottes, because that is completely linked to the idea of the show of the Baroque, in the sense that the Baroque was something that was also the first day where actually foreign powers were colonizing for a foreign territory, and this film is about, but also about the idea how they get lost in the pursuit of this specific uh, endeavor. And <clears throat> of course, with Klaus Kinski, and also the, uh, the element of endurance and violence that plays out in the film, which is a specific uh, element that the element of the real and the played substance in the film sort of intertwined with each other. I could have also could have picked the film, uh, for example, Apocalypse by uh, Francis Ford Coppola. But both actually, and I think Agia Tzandes got a, does that earlier already, has these elements there in the river. There is also the element where you can make the link in, I mean, like unconsciously can make the link with the heart of darkness, Joseph Conrad. And so, Clear it is that most of the films are about greed. They're about a, a rather pessimistic worldview. It's not an optimistic worldview, but it's a worldview that at least deals with a concrete reality, which, in which, of course, all these elements are played out. <laughs> then there's a film like uh, Medea, which is, of course, I wanted to, I saw a lot of Italian films. I could have, Deserto Rosso, I mean, which I, of course, also like from uh, Michelangelo Antonioni, which is m maybe more painterly, but I chose for the most difficult uh, filmmaker, also on a political, from a political point of view, and still not uh, unbespoken, actually, and that's uh, Pasolini. And again, the film that deals with the epic element, of course, of human nature, and also the element where the idea of what we actually believe, what we actually uh, uh, suggest within uh, a structure that is actually uh, renders the entire ambiguity of modernity and a political stance towards an actual situation and actually refers back to a history that is actually unbespoken and nearly not registered. And I find this in the Medea film as a, an oracle quite important and also to show it on a big screen. I mean, that's the most important thing is that these films have to be seen in the cinema. I don't think that any of the choices that I made can be seen on a small screen. And this is also, because I'm a painter, that I will, of course, pick them out of a pictorial uh, point of view, which is depicting film as, although I don't, I mean, I've had some uh, experience with film, but uh, that, that both mediums sort of inform each other. There's a film, Malpertus, uh, which also I know the filmmaker, and actually the filmmaker is also befriended with uh, another filmmaker, a uh, cineast uh, from the first film, Hans Jürgen Seberg. And the filmmaker I'm talking about is a Belgian filmmaker, and uh, he's called Harry Kummel. And he made a very strange film in, uh, I think it must have been the, six, the 70s also. I think one of the characters is played by Orson Welles, which was quite a big production for a Belgian movie, but the distribution was done so awfully bad that it never reached its peak, in a sense. But I saw the film also in the film theater when it came out, and it was a film that deals with Greek myths, in a sense, but was played out in rural, but also in the old city 
sort of centers of uh, the Flanders, like in Ghent and, and Antwerp and Brussels. And uh, I think the filmmaker was then still living in Antwerp, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's, it's a very strange film, which has, uh, to my opinion, has been completely underestimated, and also because it was a very large production for Belgium in that sense, and a very unexpected one, and a more international one, and an international cast also. And it is, uh, it has also an horrific part, because it becomes, uh, the, the myth sort of degrades itself, of course, to where it starts to completely deconstruct itself. It is a m sort of filmmaker that came from a very experimental way of making and uh, working with film. And it, I think this was his very first mainstream project, which then failed because of the distribution. And then there is the film uh, There Will Be Blood, which was a film that I saw when it came out, also in the film theater. And it was a film that actually completely shocked me because there was two other films that I saw before that, which was controlled by Anton Corbijn, his first film, which was a biopic about uh, Joy Division. And the second one was by the Coon Brothers, No Country for Old Men. And then the sherry on the cake in that year was actually There Will Be Blood. Why? Because these three films uh, sort of uh, utterly created an element of, which was actually rather uh, cynical in a sense, that in contemporary art world, wasn't realized yet, wasn't there in a sense. And especially There Will Be Blood, which is a film based on a novel, Oil, basically. But I read the novel and it is completely different, the film. Because the way Daniel D. Lewis actually plays out the main character in the film, which is not only about oil, but mostly about anger management in a sense. And it is insane how the film culminates and especially the last scene where you see the bowling alley in his house where he kills the young priest and says to the butler, I am done, and the words come, there will be blood. It took me a week to get away from the film because it came so close to my own anger management that my wife, after a week, said, it's only a movie. <laughs> then the social network I just put in because the one criticism towards the show the Baroque show was that there was nothing with the social media in the show, which I deliberately didn't do because I wanted to make a show that indirectly deals with it in a sense, but just doing, making the show physical and giving it physicality I think is important also with the visual. And although it's an interesting, could be an interesting line of thought to incorporate uh, <coughs> art and connect it to social media, I think this will sort of happen by itself, but we, it could be an interesting departure point, but it's a different curatorial project. But still then, I wanted to, in, to the inventor of the social Rutenberg into this, in the film programmation as maybe the last movie because it's what we are actually living. And it's also something that was invented out of a form of revenge because the breakup with his girlfriend actually initiated a wave that has changed the world. And this to show how ridiculously small an accident can be and how large the repercussions can be.